Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here to host this webinar with some delightful leaders in the industry. And we're going to have a good chat over the next hour around what, how has COVID-19 transformed, disrupted, changed the payment sector? I'd firstly like to ask my guests to introduce themselves. And in, before I start doing that, I'll just say who I am. So I'm Louise Brett. I lead FinTech and Innovation for Deloitte across the UK and Europe and are a strong supporter of Innovate Finance with whom we are co-hosting today. Joe. Thanks, Louise. Uh, really good to be here. So I'm Joanne Dewar. I am CEO of a company called Global Processing Services, or GPS. GPS is an issuer processor. So that means we are a uh, technology provider behind uh, so many of the uh, fintech solutions that we'll be talking about uh, today uh, across the, the UK, Europe, and, and uh, more widely around the world. Natalie? Um, I'm Natalie Sini, I'm Chair of Innovate Finance, and I'm also Chair of the Independent Access to Cash Review, which published a report last year into the implications of the cashless society. Thanks. And Jenny? Hey Louise. Hello everyone. My name's Jenny Mundy. I am the Managing Director for Visa in the UK and Ireland. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to see we're getting more and more participants joining us as we kick this off. And at this juncture, I would like to say I have got some questions I'm going to pose to our guests. But very much this is an inclusive session, so please use the Q&A button and table your questions and I will then moderate against them and bring them in at the appropriate juncture. But yes, please Q&A throughout. It's not a formal discussion, then Q&A at the end. So I'm going to start with now. So with the current environment, what's happening? Um, we're all living through the biggest change in our lives and payments is being massively changed. And I want to start with what's, so what's happening around the innovation topic. As we get, exist in COVID-19 and the reduction in payments transactions and the huge increase in cashless um, behavior, what, what are organizations innovating against? And Joe, as a fintech, leading a fintech, perhaps you could um, start with how you're innovating in the current environment. So I think we can start with the fact that um, the, the COVID created uh, ch challenges that, that none of us saw, saw coming and it provided uh, fintech as an industry, as a whole ecosystem, the opportunity to demonstrate uh, the uh, enormous value in agility, its ability to be able to uh, pivot at speed, uh, to be able to solve new challenges that, uh, that no one saw coming. Um, and so, you know, fantastic example was uh, you know, how we supported Starling in bringing a connected, then connected card, companion card to market within 10 days of lockdown starting. Um, there were, we've had many solutions, uh, Soldo providing support for the government disbursements in Italy, uh, Crunch for the Gibraltarian government, uh, Bread for Business, uh, B for B with uh, the um, sort of mig migrant cards or uh, support for the Salvation Army. So there was, you know, lots of new solutions piv uh, pivoting that happened very, very quickly um, to, to help fulfill uh, you know, new needs because suddenly people weren't able to uh, live their lives in the way that they had historically. And we can go into it in a lot, uh, a lot of detail, but I'll just let the others have an opportunity to. Oh, and maybe next, Jenny, you could pick up as a much more established global organisation. Perhaps people argue less nimble and agile as the newer fintechs on the block. Um, ha and clearly, there have been some fantastic innovations at Visa. Well, how has COVID nineteen and innovation? sits side by side for you? I think, um, I think across, across the board, any crisis, while in its own right is a, 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 real, a, a real tragedy, sits behind a crisis um, and, and certainly does with this one. But actually it drives innovation right the way across the board because a crisis is very galvanizing in terms of focusing on, on specific areas that need, need to be solved and need to be solved quickly and um and i think working working where we work with a lot of fintechs we work with a lot of traditional more established players as well globally but i think um i think the ability to work and to change some stuff fast is true across the board in a crisis so 
I mean, the obvious example here that, that everyone leaned into um, massively was the contactless limit increase, which we put up across the country from 30 to 45 pounds um, very, very quickly. Um, and I think everyone benefited from that. Well, I know they did. I know it resonated very, very strongly with consumers, but also with merchants because, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really um, made a, a positive impact. Um, and we can see the rollout of that and the take up of that um, very significantly. So that's one small example. Um, but there are others where, um, you know, there are carer, carer and companion cards um, coming out from, from both fintechs and, and more established players um, alike. So I think we can see some of those changes. And if we just stand back more broadly outside of payments and look at the way the banking industry and financial services has responded to this, I think it, it's extraordinary of, of how, many, how many moves have been made to, um, to, come, to come to bear in, in quite a short space of time. Um, so, so I think generally crises and innovation definitely go hand in hand. Mm. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of that and it's that lifeblood of change that is creating opportunity uh, for people to think in different ways. With Innovate Finance in your, um, and Innovate in your title, Natalie, as chair, <laughs> um, what's your perspective looking more, broad, more broadly across the industry? And I'm suspecting because she has her eyes shut, but her broadband has frozen. Right, oh. Natalie, she had um, apologised. She was having broadband issues uh, today. Um, and all of you on the call will absolutely empathise and know what that means for us working in these virtual ways. Um, so we'll park on that. But I, the next part of this innovation piece is, so what about the excluded? Are we innovating sufficiently there? Um, raising the contactless limit is fantastic if you have the contactless card, if you are currently excluded from financial services, what have you seen about how um, the industry and your organizations are involved in innovating to help them become included in what is a crisis? Joe, did you want should to? I, should I start? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right that uh, the, the move away from uh, cash and then suddenly cash not being accepted in places, you know, we never imagined there'd be quite so many places saying, right, we only accept uh, cards. Um, and and that, has, that has a, a real uh, profound uh, impact because, you know, even within the UK, there are 1.23 million people currently, uh, you know, have, having no access at all to, um, to other payment capabilities. And then many more millions who are underserved uh, in, in terms of their, their access to uh, full, full payment capabilities. Again, uh, you know, fintech's been at the forefront of uh, solving for these needs. And the, I think one of the key things to understand here is that there, is, there isn't a continuum of, you know, excluded to included and, you know, you're somewhere on that line. The excluded communities are, are, are many pockets of exclusion for many different reasons. And each of those sets of reasons, whether it's you know lack of fixed address, whether it's uh, whether it's credit uh, issues, whether it's mental health challenges, whether it's um, uh, you know there's lots and lots of different uh, ca causal factors, and they they can each be solved for, and there are different ways of of, of creating those solutions. We're behind you know a large number of sort of agency banking propositions that you see with. Uh, like uh, uh, Pocket and uh, a new account and uh, what we're doing with uh, OnePay. You know, there's lots of different uh, solutions out there, but uh, we do need to make sure that we've created solutions for all of these communities before, uh, you know, we are in a position with, where, where ca cash is actually uh, withdrawn. And I know uh, Natalie will speak to this in depth as well. Yeah, and sorry for losing you. I've got dodgy broadband at the moment. No, I, I think, Joanne, you're absolutely right. Uh, but the challenge is that the cash infrastructure is disappearing more quickly than we're filling the needs of those, those communities. And I think the other challenge is, is that a lot of those communities are not particularly profitable segments. Yeah, um, exactly. They are inherently some of the more conservative in terms of tech, tech adoption. Um, 
they are more likely to be on the lower end of the income scale and so probably not have smartphones. Um, so while there are, I mean, what was interesting when we did the access to cash review is every single one of those pockets of needs, we could envisage what the solution could be. Yeah. But coming up with those solutions in a way that makes them sufficiently mainstream, sufficiently available to everyone who needs them, I think it's going to take more than just fingers crossed and, and hope it's going to take quite a coordinated effort. And in the meantime, as you say, we've got to make sure we don't withdraw the infrastructure they depend on and, until they are ready to live in a digital society. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. And, and to, to add to that, I was speaking to somebody only last night who's uh, sort of championing a, a fantastic proposition for a, uh, a product aimed at those that have uh, you know, mental health challenges, you know, cognitive impairments. And, uh, and enabling them to still live an independent life, but within the, the you know, digital payments world, which is absolutely fantastic. But they're really struggling to get funding because it's seen as a, a niche and it hasn't got scale in the same way. And you know, that's where actually, you know, organizations such as the, the, the four of ours here, we can help sort of play a role in, in navigating you know, some of those conversations with the, the bigger bodies and, and, and funding to be able to recognize that there are the solutions out there if we can give them the right support. I mean, there might be a, a, another idea here. Um, so if we go back 15 years, what was done with digital TV, I think is a really powerful analogy. Um, so the difference was you couldn't enable digital TV without switching off the analog signal. But they knew that, again, there were pockets of people for a whole variety of reasons, from infrastructure to low incomes to lack of education to a wide variety of reasons, were going to struggle to use digital TV. Mm -hmm. So a group called Digital UK was, was established, arm's length government body supported by industry, which worked through one by one all of those needs, eventually buying for people in society TVs, as well as doing education programmes and setting standards and the tick. And, and I wonder whether, I mean, looking at, for example, Sweden, where the cashless revolution went so fast, it absolutely left people behind. And we're starting to see that in the UK. Something like a modern day digital UK might be a really good way of doing this, because I, I just don't think market forces alone are going to get there. One, um, one, one perspective as well as um, I think I think that you know, it's, it's really important that we, number one, that we talk about this, and number two, that, that, we, that we work out some, some specifics. And I think Natalie's idea is, uh, is a great one, but, you know, digital and, and vulnerable and, and solving for cash can all sit together. And I, I don't think it's, a, it's an either or kind of debate. I think coming back, Louise, to your sort of opening question around, you know, the, the impact of this crisis and, and COVID-19, I mean, we have definitely seen a radically accelerated adoption of digital in, in every way, shape or form. And when we think about the excluded, I, I kind of, it's not only consumers, but we've got to think about businesses and small businesses. And, you know, for anyone to thrive now, um, having an online presence is, is, is absolutely vital. And we've seen, you know, a, um, Obviously, I mean, we've all been locked down, so there are a big, big decline in face-to-face -face transactions, irrespective of what the contactless limit is, and a big increase in, in online transactions. So I think we have to think about the whole, you know, from, from consumers to merchants and, 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 the, and the businesses as well around how do, we, how do we sort of firstly embrace the fact that we are moving to digital fast. I don't think that's a problem per se, the question is, how do we move there quickly and how do we not leave anyone behind? And, and what are some of the steps we need to put in place to make sure that can happen? And how do we use digital to help solve that problem? I think that's a great point. I had a question raised from our audience from James Dykes, who's asking whether that should be market-led or regulation-led. Um, even things need to change and they need to change fast. Um, I mean, let me, let me give you, I, I think it's got to be both. Because take cash, it is currently entirely market-led. The only reason you put a cash machine in is because it makes you money. Um, as a result, they're disappearing at a really fast rate. Use of ATMs went down by 65% during lockdown, 12% of ATMs closed during lockdown, and there are now people who can't get cash. If you allow simply market forces to play out, 
we won't have an infrastructure for the rural economy to use cash before they're ready to go digital. So I think that's a good example of where you do actually need regulation and legislation actually to step in. Um, I think the best way of getting innovation is to allow entrepreneurs to thrive. But then I think the regulatory environment comes in in trying to get widespread adoption. I mean, a good example for me would be if we go back 10 years, one or two of the banks were giving text messages if you went overdrawn. Then the regulators said, you know what, that's just good. And then everybody does it. And I look at things like carer cards and think it's such an obvious idea, but it's such a good idea. But it's only mm -hmm. really going to help the vulnerable when every bank offers it. Mm -hmm. so I think there's a combination of, of, of market and innovation. But then I think you do need regulatory and nudge, particularly for that widespread adoption and to stop people falling through the holes when commercial services, the niches are just not commercially profitable. I've been involved um, in uh, a, a, an organisation, a, a charitable organisation that's been set up from within the um, ecosystem. It's called uh, the Inclusion Foundation. And what it was seeking to do is, as an industry, um, uh, create uh, firstly a, a kite mark to be able to establish that this product is genuinely financially inclusive and set uh, aside some characteristics and, and have an, a, a judging panel to establish that. And then create um, a, um, like a comparison website uh, to, it's called um, uh, Inclusion Signpost, to be able to, uh, for, for bodies, whether it's the, um, you know, the, the Job Centre Plus or the Citizens Advice Bureau, to be able to point to uh, somewhere to say that this is a set of products that are out there that you could I, you know, choose from, but it's it's not a, a commercial comparison website. So you haven't been able to pay sponsorship in order to be top of the list. Um, you know, it's actually saying, well, you know, if you're looking for a carer card or if you're looking for a, um, a, a card that will help you if you've got, um, you know, certain challenges, then, you know, these are the options. Um, these are the options out there. So, you know, that's, that's part of where the industry is trying to uh, respond for itself. So to to, and, and we'd love, you know, the, the, the government and regulators to get behind that. But what we didn't want is for, for things to be imposed on us thinking that we weren't trying to do things for ourselves because there, are, there is a lot of good out there. Um, inclusion is, is one of these terms that's not protected term. It's banded around. It can be used by somebody who is actually a, a payday lender or something like that, you know, be used in a very negative way. Um, and what we didn't want was the sort of the regulators to come and sort of come with a with a heavy boot but I think you know we're really trying to uh, to work to preempt some of this and if we can get the the, the government and, and regulation background to behind and support this then so much the better be delighted build on that and picking up your point Jenny about the SMEs you know apps core to the success of recovery for this country um, what are we seeing around innovation and including the SMEs that maybe aren't so digitally uh, included at the moment. Yeah, I think um, I think there's some there's some great examples. And, and let's face it, you know, for, for a lot of small businesses, and particularly if we think about some we find on the high street, I mean, you're not going to become a butcher because you're, you know, really driven by by tech and, and all things digital, probably. I mean, though I'm sure there are some butchers out there who are completely that way, but generally speaking. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think there are um, a need to sort of help help these typically high street, but these small small businesses like that um, get online. And there are some wonderful organisations um, out there doing just that. I mean, we've we've partnered with several in, in over over the over the um, last few months to try and help accelerate the number of small businesses that can go online. So I'll I'll, um, I'll give you one example as a organization called shop appy um run by a um run by uh jackie uh, mulligan who's a force of nature in a very positive way and and she's on a mission to help help small businesses help high streets get online um matching them with delivery capability as well if if needed and and she's gone from you know say 25 high streets pre-covid to well over 100 now and i think it's those sorts of initiatives that can help help um or uh, help businesses who are who are not inclined that way make it easy make it straightforward take away a lot of the um 
a lot of the pain towards doing that and uh, and, and actually help accelerate them in, in to, to thrive both in their real bricks business but also um, online as well and I think that's really really key. Thank you. I'm talking about the actual challenges in the payments businesses themselves that you've seen because of being in a crisis. We've had some very positive um, agility and pivots and partnering to take advantage and help society but running payments businesses that you both do what kind of challenges have you seen and experienced be it in your own organizations or elsewhere i mean i think um i i think like any business you know we've we've gone from uh being mostly in in working face to face with clients working in a in an office environment um to being all at home and all working like this i mean the uh, you know the catchphrase of uh, of COVID from many businesses is "you're on mute," um, and uh, <laughs> you know that's just become the reality of our lives, right? So, so I think I think just as as human beings adapting to working very very differently, and there are definite pros of that, and, and we get a lot of positive, but there are definite downsides as well. And I think we've kind of we've learned we we all know how to work well when we're when we're, you know, in an office or and, and with our and with our clients and, and working well with together together with each other, we've kind of learned how to work like this now, where everybody's out. And in lots of ways, it's wonderfully equalising. Um, you know, we're all the same size box on a screen. Um, no one really has a louder voice or a bigger voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're remote and every, you know, because we're all remote. So there's some real upsides, but you do definitely miss that that real kind of human interconnection. And I think the next phase, um, whenever it comes, um, which will be, and I, and I fervently hope we never go back to how we were before. I think we can leapfrog into a, into a new future, but we'll be a real hybrid of, of in and out. And I think solving that and redefining the way we work and really making work something we do, not a place we go, is gonna be really important. So I think, you know, I think people, ways of working, looking after each other, you know, there's some groups of people, again, who, who, who this, this has been wonderful for, and some other groups, this has been super, super tough for, you know, worry about the mental health. Um, and if you're, if, you know, if you're on your own in a, in a one bed flat in a, any central city or, or any, anywhere, that's, that's hard, right, for a lot of people, not for all, but for a lot. Anyone with preschool age or primary school age children, I feel for a lot, yeah. um, you know, that's, and, and, you know, if you've got both of those things together, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's really difficult. So I think this has been um, a very, a very tough time and, and any business starts, starts with its people. And, and we've certainly focused on that. Um, and let me, let me pause there. Yeah. Um, and I think you make some fantastic points about business in the round. I'm going to narrow it now into the payments business and payment transaction volumes down. What is that doing to businesses that are in this space? Also, credit risk modelling, operational cost changes. How, how are you seeing those sort of challenges? Joe, maybe pick that up. So um, where, where we sit, uh, so in terms, firstly, in terms of transaction volumes uh, for our business, we're, we're back to where we were um, a, by, at the end of January. So, you know, we were on we were on a growth curve anyway. So we haven't got back to our, our peak at the end of February, beginning of March, but um, it, we're back to end of January volume. So we've seen the, the, the drop and we've seen the pick up again. Um, you know, what's driving that primarily is the uh, the small value transactions. It's actually the fact now that the the, the corner shop accepts cards for buying the, the the loaf of bread or the newspaper um you know i was speaking to to my dad at the weekend i said well when did you last use cash and you know he's using the, the the contactless payment for the buying the newspaper in a way that you know he wouldn't have done previously um so you know whilst we we haven't got the the volume going through in terms of the the commutes to work and the the you know the lunchtime spends and the all the various travel cards that we've got actually it's been made up for in other ways um, and actually where we sit in the in the value chain our you know our revenue model is on the per click per transaction uh, so it's not based on the interchange and the uh, you know the 
the, the value of the transaction. So uh, it's, it's slightly different to sort of most of the players in the, that, uh, that uh, transaction uh, involvement. I would say, um, you know, in terms, of, in terms of what we've seen um, and the impacts, um, similar, similar to Joe, um, but, but we have seen a, um, a, real, a real transformation. So, and, and there's, uh, and I guess we're in the position to see some things happening around the world as well and some truisms that, that seem, trends, I guess, that seem to be common across multiple countries. So, um, we've definitely seen, I mean, people, we're just not traveling, right? I mean, these are, these are truisms that we know, but we, we can see that clearly in our, in our, in our business numbers. So, international um, trends and travel is, is right down. Um, we do see um, credit more impacted than debit, and again, that's globally true. Um, but we do definitely see recovery now happening um, pretty much around, around the world in terms of payment spend. Face-to-face -face is still very, is, is still down um, compared to what it is year on year. But that's pretty much rebalanced with what we see happening online. Um, so, um, so the mix is completely changed, even if we may be from a volume perspective where, where we kind of were um, th this time last year, if you like, um, but with a very, very different, different mix. And I think there's no question that as we start to recover, it's going to be, it's going to be domestic, um, it's going to be digital, um, and that comes back to the how do we bring people with us point. Um, and, uh, and, and debit seems to be the thing that, that I mean, is very strong anyway in, in the UK, but, but there are many countries around the world which are much more credit orientated and debit orientated. And, and even in them, we see debit being the, the big recovery um, engine. And Natalie, we're talking about the challenges of the crisis right now for the payments sector. Um, when you look across the um, payments fintechs and membership of Innovate Finance, what are you seeing there? I mean, there's obviously going to be winners and those that are being more challenged. Absolutely. And, and to some degree, it's what vertical are you in and, and when did you last do your fundraising round? So yeah. if you managed to do a fundraising round <laughs> just before lockdown, you're probably okay. If you were planning to do it during lockdown, that could be extremely bad for your business. And um, we, we published some stats recently um, that around 70% of, of fintechs are going to struggle with their funding. Um, in the immediate future, um, and then obviously each vertical has been has been very differently affected. Um, some have found this a wonderful opportunity because incumbents need to go digital very very fast. Um, and if you're a fintech offering a solution that plugs into an incumbent, brilliant. Um, so some have been rushed off their feet. Others have seen their their entire program stall. Um, so very very different and um, very mixed picture. We certainly expect to see a lot of consolidation. Um, unfortunately, it means a lot of startups will fail because they were just unlucky at doing things in at the wrong place in the, at the wrong time. But we hope that the drive for digital, because there's no doubt that we are becoming a digital economy far, far faster than we thought, will mean that the desire for incumbents to partner with fintechs has, has just accelerated. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I can agree with uh, what you're saying from a, um, you know, from a, an incumbent perspective, you know, where they're looking to say, well, actually, uh, we, we just need to get on with this now. Um, they're recognising that, that partnership is, is really part of the way forwards um, in order to be able to accelerate their own achievements. And I think, um, you know, part of what's happened through the last few months has helped highlight who's out there to partner with, you know, how do these things actually work? Um, you know, who, you know, the, the organizations such as GPS that do sit behind the, the scenes powering things and doing the heavy lifting that, that make, you know, bringing products to, to market more quickly possible. And as these businesses are surviving and then recovering um, and moving to the thrive stage, what do you think about um, industry standardization and whether some of the um, moves in that place in that way should be delayed to allow the industry to recover or should we carry along with the initiatives that are in play? Jenny, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's a little bit back to Natalie's previous sort of answer, which is, you know, is it regulatory or is it market-led? And, and I think, um, 
and I think to a certain extent it needs to be both. You know, I, I, I there's there's very rarely a a single simple answer. If there is, you know, we usually we you know the world usually kind of does it and cracks on. Um, and these sorts of things tend to be a little bit more complex. And I think um, I think uh, I think the timing of the dog barking is particularly um, pertinent. Another soundtrack to uh, the days of our times. Um, but uh, so, so I think it needs to be. I think it needs to be dual, and I think we need to see innovation coming from market, and we will. And I think we need to see um, regulators um, and industry thinking more broadly. The, the, I think the, the opportunity with this, though, is it does sharpen the focus on what the key questions are to are, are ask, um, and and also um, a lot of the a lot of the things that were always felt to be too hard to attack or to tackle suddenly become actually optional and we're talking about them and so i think you know i think this is this is the, the sort of the silver lining in this if you like is we can put things on the table now and we should put things on the table now that previously just were in the too hard basket and th and that's great and some of the the, the vulnerable um scenarios and you know, I, I love the analogy to digital TV. I think that works really well. You know, so what could we do and what should we do? And, 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 and how do we stay pragmatic about this and just focus on getting some stuff done? Um, I think th those are the things we should really push on. Yeah. And yeah. The, the, the key is not to have a, a sledgehammer uh, approach. Um, you know, we have, uh, it's a very complex uh, ecosystem. And, um, you know, but, you know, there's, there's, those of us and, you know, the, the, the three of you as well, you know, understand it very well. And I think if we can really work in, in partnership with the, uh, the regulator to really understand, you know, these are, these are the risk points, these are uh, the, the opportunities. And this is where we'd really welcome your, your support and, and help to get this right for the wider good. That's a great segue to let's think post COVID-19 and where we should be going. And George Yayura, one of our audience has um, posted a question here saying, today each payment, card present and card not present, is considered as a first time payment, ignoring the vast amount of customer merchant transactional data to provide a much more tailored payment experience and a much more affordable fair pricing model. Is it time to rethink how payment happens? And that would be a rather binary question so i'm going to just widen it and saying how should we help industry market regulators rethink how payments happens as we come out of covid 19 or as we are over covid 19. Na natalie do you want to um yeah um a wider perspective against the whole Ash is part of that solution too. Yeah, and and, and it is, and and so I'm sort of I'm very conscious the audience on this on this webinar is a very digital audience, um, but we've got a society that is becoming increasingly polarised. So, if you go back ten years, most people paid in similarish ways. Now you've got some people who pay in. I mean, for example, I, I went to the garden centre with my mother-in-law at the weekend and paid with my my phone. For all of us on this call, that's blindingly obvious. She was so gobsmacked, it took me half an hour to explain what on earth I was doing. So we've got, we've got methods of payment now that are, that are very polarized. I think the answer's got to be, and not or, that we've got to experiment. There are lots of new things we do. Anyone who's gone to pay in China um, and watched we, WeChat pay or um, Alipay, just what, or you walk into, um, a fast food store and smile at the screen which takes your biometrics and allows you to pay. I mean they're things we're not used to in the UK, they're ubiquitous in China. Um, we are going to see a proliferation of payment methods but what we mustn't do is take away the underpin that keeps everybody included. So until everyone can go digital we've got to maintain the cash infrastructure and that's going to need a lot of work but I'd love to see a multitude of payment methods proliferate and I think payments will become increasingly integrated into what we do. Actually, bizarrely, smiling with biometrics is a way that China are finding to include people in financial services because you don't need a bank account, you don't need to be literate, you just need to be able to smile. So actually some of these offer massive inclusion possibilities, mm. but we mustn't turn off what a lot of people need until we've included everyone. 
Yeah, I, 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 I think that's a, a, a great answer. I, I kind of add as well that um, I, I think when you look into the future of payments, that it is, it is going to proliferate and, um, and, and in very different ways and, and shapes than we see today. So, you know, if you, if you walk out of, of um, one of the, the new sort of Amazon type stores, you know, you, you, with, your, with your groceries or your shopping, are you, are you card present or are you card not present? You know, you walk in, you pick it up, it knows what you've done. And it, so what is that? Um, and I think we're going to see a, a more and more of a blurring of these defined kind of boundaries that we, that we have today. You know, this, you know my, my background is not financial services. So, you know, the construct of debit and credit, which has kind of been there forever. Well, what, why do we need both? Why can't, you know, as a, as a human being, what do I need? I need, you know, I need some, um, I need, I need, sometimes I need to spend money I've got and sometimes I may need uh, or, or want to pay by installments or another mechanism. Do I have to have two accounts to do that? How, how do, how do, they, so I think there'll be a blur. I think there's a blurring and a much more. And I see this, you know, whether it's with the fintechs that, that are, that are um, there to try and service a, a very clearly defined problem and the traditional players who are really seeking to, to drive a much more customer and consumer and, and business, depending on the, on the channel, orientated approach to their business. How do we really solve what the customer wants rather than how we're thinking about the world? Um, and then you have things like IoT and the Internet of Things, um, which would definitely blow your mother-in-law's um, mind if the phone did. But, you know, those, that is growing um, at a rapid rate. Um, and so, you know, they will be, increasingly will be, um, will be delegating our um, purchasing decisions to, to a thing, to a machine. Um, now, we can set the business rules about that. But so, so I think there'll be lots and lots of different places. And I think there's, you know, I think it's a really exciting time in payments because there'll be a lot of disruption, a lot of disintermediation, um, a lot of opportunity um, and a lot of change that can be a force for good for all types of society. And I think that's the thing that we need to make sure happens that, you know, it isn't just for all of us who are very happy hopping on a Zoom call and, um, but, but that it is, it is for everybody and that we are thinking about everybody in, in how we solve that. And, and maybe if I can jump in, I think the examples Jenny's given also come back to the question of regulation. So we are hitting regulatory barriers now in trying to do sensible things because we've defined things far too rigidly. So a conversation Jenny and I have had many times over the last couple of months is, believe it or not, it's illegal to give cash back without purchase in the UK, mm. which is insane. Um, mm. And yet it's not a specific exemption in PSC2 and, yet, and so it's going to require primary legislation. That's insane when yeah. actually help local communities, um, villages stay alive because you've reduced their, their risk of storing cash overnight, you've helped a local community, you've solved some of their banking needs. So this is also where we need regulators to unblock some of the things that are just stopping common sense things happening. Yes. Yeah, it's, you know, and, and that's an industry-wide thing we're now trying to roll out and, 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 and everyone is, is on board with that. It's just the, 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 you know, the fact that actually it's illegal um, right now. Um, and, um, you yeah. know, we need to solve that. And it's legal to remove ATMs at the rate that that's happening. Yeah. And as you pointed out earlier, to me, it's up to 65% drop in volumes. Yeah. Yeah. So while that's permitted and the um, cashback isn't, we've got a complete disconnect. Don't we just? <laughs> So future opportunities, Joe, post COVID-19, what's your perspective there? So it, it builds again on, on what uh, Jenny was just saying, you know, there is a continual, there's a progression in terms of uh, blurring the lines um, and um, whether it's between the different rails, uh, as in with, within card payments, or the the, the, the blurring between uh, card and and you know when a, when a, when there's a card payment, you know when it's got agency banking capabilities, um, the uh, and, and and a mashing of of different types of, of functionality and a lot is going to come down to the, uh, the use of data and how we can use the data to best support the consumer. So back to the uh, question we were just answering before, you know, we currently treat each payment as the first payment that 
that customer has had. But actually, we do know about that that cardholder, that customer, or you know, the 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 bank or the fintech can have that knowledge. And you know, I look forward to to a world where my my app can can point out to me, oh, it, it looks like that you didn't tap out at the end of your journey tonight. You know, your normal journey home because we are we are quite predictable uh, you know sadly predictable as, as, as people and I uh, you know the, the where fintech can go in terms of you know actually helping us with with our our real world so as you say not thinking about whether I'm paying with a debit card or, or a credit card uh, not thinking about it in the way from the financial services perspective but thinking about it in a way of how are we solving uh, real customer challenges and, and creating real opportunities and there it's, are, it's all there um, it's coming yeah and that there are already a lot of a lot more um, um, probably more than many people realize but I think there are a lot of um, AI and, uh, and machine learning and trend analysis that does go into behavior as to when you get stepped up and when and when you don't so I think a lot of that does happen it's not that that everything is individual um but from a, a, a sort of meta perspective um there is a lot of there is capability out there um can it be improved yes and i and i think it will and you know it's a bit like um thinking about uh fraud and and cyber as well i mean a, a lot of a lot of these a lot of these industries now are getting better and better at using trend analysis, not only individually, more importantly, um, on, a, on a sort of macro level, to spot anomalies and unusual pieces. And I think that's, you know, there, there's a lot of positive, um, there's a lot of, lot of positive outcomes uh, from, from those sorts of things um, in, in our industry and in others. I guess the other side of what we've just been talking about is use of data. So we have a question here from Petronella Loffler, who says, the elephant in the room is what is done with all this data. China will almost certainly be using the data centrally to track people. How can we mitigate this risk? I, um, I think this is a really, really important question. Um, and I think data, ha having some really core thought through um, strong um, data principles, data ethics, um, it is absolutely vital. Um, I know in, in Visa, we're certainly putting a lot of effort and energy into this. Um, but, and, and I think ideally, um, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a, common, a common set, or it's like, they're like values really, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I think the challenge we're gonna have globally um, is that very different countries and different markets and different cultures have very different values and so you're going to see data thought about in very different ways and of course when you start to apply that then into artificial intelligence and um, and then we start talking about biases um, particularly unconscious biases that can get built, built into that data set um, I think this is going to be one of the um, one of the most important topics um, and and and, and opportunities and problems and I am I am an optimist and think technology and these advances delivers us far more good than 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 the negative fallouts but we do need to think hard about how we do it so that we can mitigate um, as much of the unintentional consequences as possible so a clear set of data principles around your data ethics for your for your company um, for the way that you work um, you know, we, we, are, we are living in an age where people will, will choose to buy things from and partner with and work with and support and invest in um, organizations where actually doing good will make a massive difference. And we have a big responsibility to step up to that. I think uh, data companies, data policy is actually ultimately going to become a big uh, differentiator in terms of you know wh whether they are uh, as you say it comes comes back to uh, ethics you know are they using it for actually that consumer's uh, own good and it's you know staying within the company or is it being sold on for all sorts of other purposes and at the moment you know a lot of that is is buried in the terms and conditions and um, you know I wonder what it's going to take you know is it going to be some kind of 
scandal before people really lift this to the to the fore uh, to understand how uh, you know the the pros and cons you know what can happen with with data i think there's there's also quite a shocking lack of awareness from many consumers about how much data is held and what it means mm. i mean I, if we go back to some of the facebook scandal of what was it two years ago now i think every one of us that work with fintechs and data looked and thought well of course they were doing that um and yet most of the public were utterly shocked so i think i fear joanne it will take a couple of scandals for people to realize i think the other thing is it will become a barrier to progress if we don't do what jenny has said um, I mean, what's quite interesting about the shift away from cash is when I went to Sweden and asked them, why is Sweden going so fast? The main reason was trust. We trust the banks, we trust the government, therefore we're willing to go digital. Mm. Um, and, and I think that issue of trust is going to be so critical, um, actually, if we want digital payments to advance. So it's going to become a right to play. Yeah, I, th I think it's absolutely critical. And that this is use of data. Um, that is uncertain of the merits of it. I think you've got the other angle, which is actually the bad actors. There's another question here from Sabine Petty, who's saying digital innovation and progress will likely also allow bad actors, scamsters, to come up with new ways of fraud. How should these aspects be addressed? Is it via the regulatory consumer protection, or should fintechs step up and come up with ways to stop such events? Shall I have a go? Um, I mean, <laughs> My view is, is fraudsters and criminals will find whatever way they can to make money. And as technology changes, they'll go with the new. Um, I also think regulation will always be fight, fighting last year's battle. Um, so actually it has to be all of our responsibilities to think of innovative ways to keep away fraudsters. If we wait for the regulatory standards, we'll always be on, on the back foot. Um, the good thing is there are some fantastic fintechs doing amazing things in, in, in looking at how to, to combat cyber fraud. Um, but it has to be something we're all vigilant about. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree. I like, I like your analogy that says that, um, you know, regulators look at yes, yesterday's problems. I mean, it's certainly true that, you know, for every uh, startup, don't you know this, for every bin that goes live, uh, you know, there are all, there are, attacks happening on bins uh you know and they're, they're very often the first transactions that that you see on a new bin um equally you know out of the the first hundred customers of a a new startup you know some of them would be competitors some of them journalists and some of them are fraudsters who are you know they're, they're looking for the holes in the newest companies um you know it's a sad fact of life and you know it's one of the areas where we can all as you know experienced partners help guide uh, you know new new startups to understand and you know learn from other people's mistakes because i'll tell you what it happens every single time yeah. i'm going to pivot slightly now to um other moves that are affecting the payments industry but are also part of it and uh, we've got two questions here on open banking and how it may globally accelerate digital adoption post COVID-19. And then a second on open finance, changing how that might change the payment sector. So the direction of travel of open, how are we seeing that affecting payments? Maybe Jenny can start with that. Um, I, I, I think we'll see it, I think we'll see it uh, um, affect it a lot. Um, I think we're right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, my kind of summary of where we're where we're sort of up to is i think um i think 2019 and 2020 of well pre-covid anyway have all been about compliance you know there, there's a, a lot of work that needed to be done to be compliant with psd2 and secure customer authentication and a lot of focus on on getting that in place and there still is because of course we've had a, a little bit of a stay of execution with um you know that, that's coming into force I think once we get through the compliance, and of course we will, um, then I think we'll start to move into, in, in, into well, what are the opportunities and, and how do we really do that? We're already seeing a lot of, a lot of um, organizations come out with, um, with open banking type solutions and, and everyone will be dipping their toe in the water. Um, it's, it's not clear yet what are gonna be the real successes um, and, the, and the real um, the you know the the real kind of winning plays I think 
Um, but we will we will get there. And again, I doubt it'll be one single thing. There'll be some there'll be some um, fintechs who solve some 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 great initiatives. There'll be um, you know platform and the platform players. I think are going to be key um, in in this as well. Um, but there's no there's no question. It's going to be a very exciting five years and an open banking will be something that um has a major place um but we're right at the very beginning totally agree based on that are there any markets you think are slightly further ahead with better use cases i mean clearly the uk is one of the leading markets but from your perspective are there any really good use cases emerging globally um I think um, I mean I think the U.S. is the U.S. is interesting to to look at. I mean, in in lots of ways, you kind of look at the U.S. in in payments and you know like contactless adoption, for example. I I use that as a bit of a proxy. Is 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 very low. You know, they've only just opened up one or two lines again pre-COVID and in on the New York subway, for example. Whereas you know anyone who lives in well in any of the major cities in the U.K. Um, you know, has been enjoying contactless travel for quite some time and TFL quite rightly can kind of stand up and, and look at themselves as a, a bit of a world leader in this regard. Um, but, um, but I think the US has been interesting to see just the sheer um, adoption of, of some of the platform players and some of the developments that have been going. But again, you know, I don't think there's any one market we can look at and say, oh, there's the future. I think you can look at Sweden and, 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 and learn some lessons at, and, and the Nordics more broadly around sort of cash and cash loose. Um, I think that's very interesting. You can look at Asia and learn some lessons around, you know, a lot of the, the, you know, the examples Natalie used before around WeChat and so forth and different payment mechanisms. But I think the wonderful thing we have here in the UK is we are quite a mature um, digital country. Um, both in e-commerce and, 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 in our, and in the way that we pay and our adoption of digital payment methods. Um, and we do have PSD2 and open banking and we have a very um, conducive environment for fintechs. No, nowhere else in the world, I think, do all these things come together. Exactly um, right. and, and I think that's why this is such an exciting time. And what we have right now is we're, we're sort of, we're asking the right questions and we're seeing some things starting to pop out but we're nowhere near the point where we're going, yeah, here are the answers and this is going to succeed and that's not. Um, this, is, this is the exciting time. You know, this is the time where we can start to sort of work out, you know, the opportunities that exist for, 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 for many of us. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a really exciting few years ahead. Yeah, we've certainly got a, uh, a number of uh, partners with solutions that we're currently incubating, so they've not yet gone to, to public launch, but we're really excited as to what they're able to do. Um, look, watch your space. <laughs> <laughs> Watching this space, it leads on to the next question we've been presented with from Ivan Chow, who's saying, any thought on how central bank digital current payments industry? Natalie, do you want to take that? It, it's, a, it's a really interesting one. Um, I, I'm, I'm still processing in my head how this might work. I mean, S Sweden is the furthest ahead on, on thinking about this in, in response to uh, Sweden going cashless. And of course, the reason Sweden started thinking about the, the digital krona was essentially to preserve the role of the fiat currency um, with a serious fear in, in Sweden that essentially they've privatised their currency um, with all the economic implications that come with it. And I think for central banks, that, that's a large part of the driver, that essentially it's a fiat currency, we're just paying digitally. So in many ways, if, if, that, and that, if that follows through, that shouldn't be a big driver on, on changing payments, because if you distinguish between the currency and the wallet, most of the change is going to happen in the wallet, not the currency. That's about as far as my thinking's got on it so far. Any? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think digital, digital currencies, um, you know, we saw the, you know, the fate, we had the Facebook um, Calibra um, piece as well, didn't we? I, look, I think digital currencies definitely have a, a place, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a 
there's a lot of noise about them. Mm. Um, again, you know, the e Krona um, piece, the Facebook piece, um, they will emerge in some way, shape or form of that. I'm, 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 I'm sure they will. Um, quite how, I, again, I think if we're at the beginning of open banking, we're even, we're even earlier in earlier, the, yeah. earlier in, earlier in this one. Um, do I think, do I think they will come of age and, and actually happen? Yes. Um, do I think they'll fundamentally, um, you know, you know I, I think they'll find their place. I don't, I don't know that we'll get to a point. I mean, the Nordics may make me rethink this, but I'm not sure we'll get to a place where we say, right, that's it. It's digital. You know, it's a digital currency only. Um, I think they'll, they'll have, a, they'll have a, a, a place across many, many markets in, in, in certain specific areas rather than um, eradicate currency more, more broadly. I agree. And I think that's, that's been our theme of this conversation, that it's the and, it's not the either or. And mm -hmm. payments, digital payments, contactless payments, and cash, and digital currency potential. Um, maybe we could just go back to the, um, the, the cash um, question. And innovation and support for cash as one of the mechanisms of payments that's going to be with us, even with Sweden's um, concerns on it, um, it is going to be with us. And uh, you're from Natalie, having done the work on the access to cash um, thinking, what is your view of, kind of the next five years, the future, the things that need to be in place? We definitely need innovation in cash. I mean, the, the reality in the UK is we have a very expensive cash infrastructure built for a different age. And if we're going to expect the banks to continue to support it, it's got to be lower cost. Um, so I think it, it's pretty certain the government will introduce legislation which will put an, a legal obligation on the banks to keep cash viable. We've already seen a Bank of England consultation come out two weeks ago, which I think gives some indications of where this all might go. And that was to essentially say of wholesale cash infrastructure, run it like a utility. So where I could see some of the retail cash infrastructure going is, is a similar model. And the Nordics again have done this, where a lot of the UK's retail cash infrastructure becomes frankly run for cost rather than run for competition. But then if I go back to the, the, the cash back analogy, we also need to find smarter ways and put a physical ATM in and have a man in a van who puts cash in a machine. Cash back is a good option. There, there are a whole variety of other things we could look at. And in fact, we're, we're running right now um, eight cash pilots across the UK working with communities who, who need help, looking specifically at this sort of innovation to see if we can try, try other ways of keeping cash viable that meet community needs at lower cost. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I'm conscious we're almost up on the hour and I wanted to just give you all um, a one last sort of comment to the audience, a hope for the future. I think we've talked about the excitement of the next five years. In closing out, I'm going to thank you for being fantastic conversationalists um, and having this conversation over the last hour. And just what advice would you give the audience who are involved in payments or interested in payments, because that's why they're on this call, as to how they should be thinking about the next five years, the post-COVID-19 opportunities. Hey, do you want to go first with that? I, um, I, I, I think we should be, you know, we should be really excited about the future. I think there's a lot of change and change is great, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's energizing, it's, it's fascinating and it's a, it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's all about learning and, and, and leaning into new things. So I, I think we should feel very excited. I also think we should feel um, optimistic about um, the, what we can do as an industry, but also what the regulators will do. You know, I'm a, I am an optimist, but I think there are, I, I also believe that pragmatism will reign and that the right decisions will get made. So, um, you know, from what I've seen, you know, financial services and, and, and payments is full of, a lot of very smart people motivated to do the right thing. So I feel confident. I hope you do too. Thank you. Joanne. Um, struggle to say anything much different. Certainly the, the, the future's uh, bright. And uh, I would agree that there's, there's a whole bunch of very uh, passionate people who are wanting to do the right thing 
by by wider society they you know they're, they're not just looking at making the the fast buck for themselves so you know the the innovators behind so many of the um financially inclusive products you know they're absolutely passionate about doing the right thing i think you know the the likes of ourselves working together with the, the regulator um and government we're going to achieve some you know continue to achieve uh, you know, world-leading innovation, and we know throughout the fintech uh, revolution that's happened over the past sort of four or five years, the UK has been leading the world, and the rest of the world's been looking on. And, and I thoroughly believe that that's set to continue. Thanks, Jo. And I'd I, I'd echo all of that, and just add, but let's not assume everybody in society looks like us, um, because we have got a very wide range of needs and what we've got to do as we innovate is also make sure we bring everybody with us. Well thank you all, it's been a fantastic conversation and a great end, um, very exciting times, let's look ahead, this crisis is pro providing the opportunity to innovate, to do new things, to collaborate across organisations, with regulators, with markets and with consumers, so thank you all for listening and uh, have a good rest of your days. Thank you, bye.